Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Horror Mine. My name is Vic Shai, and this is The Scare Score, where I break down horror movies and rate them on how scary I think they are. In the fifth and final part of our Month of Mike special, I'll be going over the 2004 anthology horror film, Three Extremes. The film contains three different horror films by directors from three Asian countries, China's Fruit Chan, South Korea's Park Chan-wook, and Japan's Takashi Mike. Three Extremes Dreams has some of Asia's most influential directors coming together to create some pretty disturbing films. But how scary is it? Sit back and relax and join me as we explore three extremes and tally up the scare score. Our first film is titled Dumplings and is brought to us by Hong Kong filmmaker Fruit Chan. I'm not very familiar with his work and this was his first foray into horror. However, this was the only film out of the three to be turned into a full feature length film. Our movie begins in an apartment complex somewhere in Hong Kong. We see a taxi pull up and drop off our main character, Mrs. Lee. Mrs. Lee is a former actress that quit acting a long time ago. She rings on the apartment door of Aunt May, who sells the most expensive dumplings in the area. Aunt May flaunts her wrinkle-free fair skin and says she is much older than she looks. Her dumplings are so expensive because they are supposed to help keep its consumer looking younger. As Mrs. Lee waits for her meal, we see Aunt May getting busy in the kitchen. She brings out the dumplings and ominously tells her to think of the result and not what they were. Mrs. Lee eats the dumplings and she has a hard time swallowing them down. Aunt May says that only her secret formula can make women look younger. Aunt May has a custom of singing a song from her youth when her customers eat. She blesses Mrs. Lee with the vocals while she eats the dumplings in a very sensual way. We are then hit with a sex scene out of nowhere, but I'm not complaining. The man is Mrs. Lee's husband and he was having sex with a younger woman. He says that he must go out of town again and writes Mrs. Lee a large check to keep her occupied. It's an obviously loveless marriage that she stays in just for the money. Aunt May visits a hospital and looks like she's doing a drug deal for a secret ingredient to her dumplings. Mrs. Lee reveals to Aunt May that she is unable to have children. Aunt May says worry not because her dumplings are the solution to all her problems. She asks Aunt May for the more potent stuff for faster results. Aunt May says that the most potent are those that are 5 to 6 months and that the meat is tougher by the third trimester. You heard right, the secret ingredient to Aunt May's dumplings are human fetuses. Look, we already knew she wasn't using Japanese A5 Wagyu, but the revelation that she is using human fetuses and fetuses them to people was enough to send chills down my spine. Mrs. Lee consumes and critiques the dumplings like she's Gordon Ramsay on Kitchen Nightmares. What the fuck are they? She doesn't seem happy with the results and asks for the most potent ingredient possible. As Mrs. Lee leaves the apartment, another woman and a young girl show up to her doorstep. Mrs. Lee goes back to the hotel she's staying at but doesn't go into the room because her husband is busy with another woman. She has resorted to the lowest of lows to regain the affection of her cheating husband. We then learn exactly where Aunt May gets the most potent ingredients for her nightmare kitchen. She performs an abortion on a young girl which is a really uncomfortable scene to sit through. The mother seems extremely concerned, but Aunt May says that the girl will be fine. The most disturbing part is how normal Aunt May is going about everything. She not only performs abortions on women, but feeds the fetuses to customers and actually seems proud of her work. Oh, yeah. Mrs. Lee comes back for her dose of dumplings but gets a little curious about what goes on behind the scenes. Aunt May should consider turning her business into a hibachi grill. I love the cute little dog in the corner just watching. Mrs. Lee peels back the curtains and gets freaked out when she sees the actual fetus. This is a different kind of scary. The entire concept of cooking fetuses for consumption makes me feel really yucky. However, seeing Aunt May casually going about doing so makes it that much more unnerving. Make no mistake, Mrs. Lee already knew what she was eating, but it hit her differently to actually see it in person. The next scene shows that Aunt May is obsessed with the way she looks and Mrs. Lee looks at her with envy. In arguably the film's most disturbing scene, Aunt May tells Mrs. Lee about the fetus and is almost marveling at it. She says the mother was a young schoolgirl and that this is her firstborn. The fetus is especially rare because boys hardly ever get aborted in China. Mrs. Lee no longer seems phased about being a cannibal and now looks like she enjoys it. She gets a call on herself 
while informing her that her husband just broke his leg. After eating the most potent dumplings yet, Mrs. Lee seems like a totally different person and we see her smiling for the first time. She visits him in the hospital and he is now gushing over her. The dumplings seem to have done the trick and the two proceed to have some steamy hospital sex. I feed myself like that, just don't ask me how. The young girl and her mother get off a bus and she has lost a large amount of blood from her abortion. The man who takes her seat was unfortunately wearing the whitest pants possible. The girl collapses in the street and passes out from the blood loss. Mrs. Lee throws a party and her friends compliment her new youthful look. They start complaining about an odd smell that seems to be coming from Mrs. Lee. She scratches her neck and has developed a rash. She goes into the bathroom, hops into a bath and calls Aunt May about her unusual side effects. She says that the baby was of the rarest variety because his father was also his grandfather. <laughs> she turns on the TV and breaks down in tears when she sees a rerun of her old show. Sometime later, she goes to the doctor and is told that she is two months pregnant. It looks like those special dumplings cured her infertility, but can they cure my ED? The police rush up to an apartment that is the location of a bloody scene. The distraught mother of the young girl is covered in blood and holding a knife. She stabbed her husband multiple times for causing the death of their daughter who died on the street from blood loss. Aunt May realizes that she's in deep shit and decides to Get out of town! and take a vacation to beautiful Sunny Seashores Resort. The police raid her apartment and find all the abortion tools that she hid. Mrs. Lee watches from afar and realizes that she just lost her supplier. Aunt May is now keeping a low profile but is still carrying out her operations. The humming adds a level of creepiness and a sort of folklorish feel to this story. Sometime later, we see an emotionless Mrs. Lee in a bathtub performing an abortion on herself. She then creepily looks over at the camera with blood running down her lips after having consumed her own fetus. <laughs> This is without a doubt Dumpling's scariest scene. The way she menacingly looks at the camera with a drop of blood running down her lips was truly unsettling. Couple that with the creepy humming and we have ourselves a great scare scene in a disturbing but not so scary movie. In the film's final scene, we get one final shot of Mrs. Lee taking a crunchy bite out of a dumpling while staring intensely into the camera as the movie ends. Our next film is titled Cut and comes from the brilliant mind of South Korea's Park Chan-wook. Our movie begins with an old man getting his blood sucked on by a vampire as a creepy piano tune plays in the background. She calls another vampire and says that her stomach doesn't feel too well after that meal. She starts playing her piano but begins throwing up. We then see a film crew and the film's director, Ryu ji -oh, before a clever transition into the film's title. On his way out, he is approached by several people, including a man dressed as a schoolgirl. He drives one of his co-workers home and has a conversation with his wife over the phone. He gets home late at night and his house looks just like the earlier film set. He makes himself a smoothie way healthier than I would have and the lights suddenly go out. The unknown intruder drinks the entire smoothie, which is not only scary, but highly inconsiderate. In classic survival horror fashion, Gio turns on his lighter, which proves to be a hot mistake. He wakes up and how he doesn't look like Two-Face times two is beyond me. We see a gagged woman sitting on the piano with her body completely attached to wires. This is a disturbing shot that looks even scarier with the mascara running down her face. The woman is revealed to be his wife Miran and the intruder super glues her fingers to the piano. Gio tells him to take all their jewelry and begs him to let them go. He realizes that they are no longer in his house but in the identical movie set. He asks the intruder who he is and things get pretty comical. He goes through several costume changes to reveal that he was an extra in all of Geo's films. This film is darkly comical, a trademark of director Park Chan-wook. <laughs> The scene goes from comical to brutal in the blink of an eye when the irate extra chops off one of his wife's fingers with an axe. He is purposely chopping off her fingers because she is a pianist. 
brutal. Gio tries comforting his wife and the intruder stands behind him to mock him. The extra says that Gio has always been kind to him even when others weren't. He says that most rich people are scumbags with no respect for people and doesn't consider them human. However, he says that Gio is a good man despite being rich and famous. The extra is disgusted by his kindness and wants him to prove that he can sin. He says that he will let his wife go if he is willing to kill someone and we hear coughing coming from underneath a white sheet. Gio removes the sheet which reveals a little girl bound and gagged on the couch. The extra says that he kidnapped the little girl on his way here because she looked bored. Gio must either kill the little girl or watch all of his wife's fingers get chopped off. The extra talks about his abusive upbringing and that he now abuses his son and wife. Although I can empathize with being dealt the wrong cards at a young age, taking your aggression out on the world and turning into a bad person is never the answer. He chops off her ring finger and her wedding band rolls on the floor covered in blood. He asks his wife if he should kill the young girl, but she tells him not to. He tries giving the extra life advice by quoting one of his films, but he isn't having it. In an absolutely hilarious scene, the extra breaks into a dance number. I know that this is the scare score and that this is far from scary, but I love this scene way more than I should. <laughs> On that same note, this is the scare score and this scene is far from scary. The film once again transitions from comedy to darkness when the extra confesses to having murdered his wife that morning. He strangled her for over 30 minutes and her tongue stuck all the way out. He even thought about murdering his own son but couldn't go through with it. Gio then confesses to cheating on his wife for the past three years with the wardrobe girl he drove home earlier. He then goes on an entire rant about how he practically hates his wife. He goes all in and doesn't hold back. He talks about how talentless she is and that she doesn't need her fingers because she can't even play the piano. He says she doesn't cook or clean and is pretty much useless. Ouch. Definitely not the most strategic time to say that. It's almost as painful as the time my mother chose to tell me I was adopted to make me feel better after my dog just died. Both of these instances weren't the best time. <laughs> Also, that cutout of Miran is pretty darn creepy. The extra tells him that she's also been having an affair, but he seems to already know about it. The extra says that he'll delay chopping off her fingers every time Gio can make him laugh. Gio goes off on the extra, but it's obvious that he's just putting up a front and it doesn't work. He tries making him laugh by resorting to cheap comedy, which doesn't get a laugh out of the extra. He grabs the three fingers he already cut and gets jump scared by the mannequin prop from the film. To prevent her fingers from being reattached, he cruelly shreds them in the blender. He then takes the gag out of her mouth and she screams at Gio to kill the little girl. He chops off one more finger before Gio starts strangling the child. He chokes the child unconscious, revealing that the girl is actually the extra son wearing a wig. He goes to check on his son and sees that he is still breathing. The extra threatens to chop off her whole hand and starts counting down. Gio rushes back over to the boy and starts choking him again. With less than 10 seconds to go, he begins walking backwards, trips on the ring, and falls on top of Miran. He gets trapped in the wires and Miran uses the opportunity to pull a rig grind and takes a huge chunk out of his neck, killing him. It could be said that this was foreshadowed in the very first shot of the film as the vampire was feeding on the man's neck. She even throws up blood afterwards the exact same way. The son sheds a tear for his dad and says that he is going to take revenge. Gio is totally shocked by everything that just took place. He walks over to his wife who now looks terrifying with all the blood on her face. Gio has totally lost it and confuses his wife to be the extra son. In the film's final scene, she looks at him bewildered as he wraps his hands around her neck and chokes Miran to death. Her tongue cartoonishly sticks all the way out, the same way the extra described his own wife earlier. Having evaded death a second time, the extra son has one of the best plot armors I've ever seen. After unknowingly murdering his own wife, the crazed Geo looks up at the ceiling as the movie ends. The third and final film is titled Box and is brought to us by Japan's Takashi Miike. Our movie begins with a single shot of a leafless tree in a snowy field. We see a man burying a box into a hole with a woman seemingly trapped inside the box within a plastic bag. 
Our main character, Kyoko, wakes up from the dream and says that it always ends there. The film's title appears with a disassembled doll inside of a box that looks downright creepy. She meets with her publisher, Yashi, who seems to have a crush on her. While speaking with him, she eerily says, the box is too small, I can't breathe. She takes off her coat, approaches him, and briefly touches his face. She gives him her latest work and he says that her books have been doing really well. He talks about her neat handwriting and how she is left-handed. She tells him that she has no choice because she can't type, both of those things hinting at the film's twist ending. He says her novels have been doing very well and gives her a small gift. As he leaves the apartment, he notices a creepy young girl staring at him. A noise behind him makes him turn around and the young girl quickly disappears. He gets into the elevator and the creepy girl can be seen walking up the stairs. The gift is a small music box that I've always found to be beautiful, sad, and creepy. She opens a large box and takes out a small dart. The little girl stands in the hallway and is humming along with the music box. Kyoko goes out to speak to the little girl and calls her sister. Her little sister looks back at her and looks very unsettling. We briefly see a box on fire before the little girl says that it's hot and she's burning. This was a nicely done scene that did a good job in reminding me that I was still watching a horror film. We then get a very eerie scene involving two twins performing a circus act. Takashi Miike definitely has a thing for ballet dancing. <laughs> Just like the film as a whole, the entirety of this scene is very dreamlike and feels like it's taking place in another world. The two twins climb into a box and are locked inside by the ringmaster. He throws a dart at both of them and flowers burst out of the boxes. We are watching a flashback into Kyoko's past with her twin sister Shoko. The ringmaster named Higata praises Shoko for the performance and gives her a necklace. He says nothing to Kyoko and walks right past her like she doesn't exist. Shoko tells her sister to keep trying but that's not what she wants wants to hear. Kyoko regularly practices her routine hoping to gain some attention. Her attempts go unnoticed and she even sees Higata sleeping with Shoko. Yikes. Talk about creepy. Back in the presence, Kyoko is wearing an outfit that resembles Higata's and is standing outside in the snowy street. As a crowd of people walk past her, Higata briefly appears before she is called out by Yoshi. She tells him about Higata and says that he looks just like him, which tends to happen when the same actor is playing two characters. We see another circus flashback where the twins are practicing their act. Shoko is inside of a box and Kyoko decides to lock her in. Kyoko wants to know what it feels like to be Shoko and get the same attention that she does. She tells Shoko that she will only be there for one night. Higata witnessed the whole thing and tries to get Shoko out of the box. The distraught Kyoko grabs a dart and slashes him across the face with it. She accidentally knocks over a heater which catches on fire and burns Shoko alive inside of the box. Shoko! Higata tries to help Shoko as the circus is quickly engulfed in the flames. Kyoko runs out into the woods and it transitions into her older self running in the woods. We then get a disturbing scene of Higata manipulating the body of a doll that resembles the twins. The doll's face is very lifelike and looks pretty unsettling. As he twists the doll, Kyoko is lying in the snow seemingly very turned on. He wraps the doll inside of a plastic bag and Kyoko also gets wrapped in a bag. We see the same dream sequence from the beginning of the film and Kyoko once again wakes up in bed. One day, she sees a bouquet of roses with an invitation. She is invited back to the old circus located in the middle of the snowy field. Inside, she sees the burned box on top of the stage. She calls out to Shoko and apologizes for what she did. The box starts shaking and we hear Shoko crying for help. <sighs> She opens the box and is disgusted by what she sees inside, though we don't get to see. Higata appears right behind her and gets really handsy with her. He then grabs her by the hair and forces her to look at what she did to her sister. <laughs> Look at it! Look at it! 
The box slowly opens and we see a small glimpse of the burned Shoko. She apologizes for what she did and we see a look of pure sadness in Shoko's eye before she retreats back into the box. Higata gives Kyoko a necklace which is something she always wanted from him as a child. He says that he always had one saved for her meaning she just had to wait a little longer. The two share a passionate kiss and Higata traps Kyoko inside of a plastic bag. He says that there cannot be one without the other and that Shoko and Kyoko together are a perfect pair and one in the same. He stuffs Kyoko inside of the box with her dead sister and buries them together inside of the hole. Kyoko once again wakes up from the dream that always ends there. However, this time, it is revealed that Kyoko and Shoko never separated. The two are Siamese twins and have been stuck together since birth. The entire events of the film have truly been a dream and a figment of the imagination of both twins. This was hinted at in the beginning of the film when they talked about Kyoko being left-handed and not being able to use a typewriter. In the film's final scene, we see Higata tossing a shovel after having buried both twins in the snowy field as the movie ends. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Three Extremes. This was definitely a different type of horror anthology film that I was not expecting. The entire thing felt like a surreal, dreamlike experience and not your typical horror film. Each film felt distinctively unique and I feel each respective director truly made each segment their own. However, with every horror anthology film, there must be a weak link. In this case, I felt that Cut was the weakest out of the three entries. Not to say that it was bad, but it was the least scary and and brought down the scare factor of the entire film as a whole. The strongest and scariest entry was Dumplings. The concept itself was truly horrifying and highly disturbing. Box was somewhere in the middle. It had a creepy and surreal feel to it, but that's about it. Nothing really too scary or intense really happens. With all that said, Three Extremes was sort of a letdown. None of the short films were very scary and all of them combined couldn't live up to the film's title, earning Three Extremes a not-so-extreme scare score of 4 42%. The scariest scene in the film was Dumpling's final scene. Mrs. Lee staring into the camera after having ate her own fetus was the single most terrifying shot of the entire film, sort of making me wish that they saved Dumplings for last. But, as always, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Thank you all so much for the support you've all showed me during our month of Mike special, and I really hope I can do something like this again someday. I cannot wait to see y'all right back here in the Horror Mine. Y'all stick around.